All right, this episode of Real Talk with Pat B is sponsored by Bella Mays Tea. Bella Mays was launched in 2020, an online tea company specializing in herbal blends that's good for the mind, body, and soul. Check them out at www.bellamaystea.com. Use the promo code Pasha B and receive 10% off. Get ready for Real Talk with Pasha B in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right. Thank you for tuning into this week's episode of Real Talk with P. Yeah, we're going to do that again. Hold on, y'all. That's a blooper. Mm-hmm. We're going to try it one more time. Get ready for Real Talk with Pasha B in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right. Thank you for tuning into this week's episode of Real Talk with Pasha B. Ah, it's Pasha B. Yes, yes, yes. It's me again. And of course, Shanika. What's up, Asha? What's up? What's up? We're doing another podcast, of course. Of course. Why else would we be here? But I'm excited about this podcast. You are? What are you talking about today, Pat? Because our first and foremost, we have a guest. We do. Shanika, introduce the guest. Sitting in with us today is Von Michael. Von Michael is a comedian and he hosts Quarantine Comedy Special. Vaughn, how are you today? What's going on, ladies? How are y'all? I'm good. Awesome, awesome. Welcome to the Real Talk with Pastor B podcast. I, I didn't like that. She sounded like she was on the goddamn Walmart. <laughs> what? You act like he was calling for help at Register 4. <laughs> oh, my. It was... <laughs> that was really polite for Walmart. You know? <laughs> Publix. 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 <laughs> Yes, as Shanika said, we have a comedian, Von Michael. He is promoting his comedy special um, titled Quarantine Comedy Special. And Vaughn, how are you today? I am good. I'm great. I'm glad to be on here, first of all. Um, I do want to let you know, I did not know that y'all had so many negative thoughts about millennials. Um, I listened to y'all last, <laughs> last episode and I was like, whoa, I felt attacked. I was sitting, oh, I had to pause, no. rewind. I was like, whoa. So I just want to let you know that as millennials, we are good people. Um, not all of us <laughs> are those negative stereotypes. Those weren't our thoughts. Those were the thoughts of the people that we communicated, you know. We communicate. And I think what we did was we found as a takeaway that millennials, you know, they're they're not too much different than us right like we mm-hmm. just need to take the time and opportunity to talk to you guys it looks it looks different when we're separated but when we're together we talking the same shit kind of <laughs> like race black and white people Abs- yep that's true so tell us about yourself Vaughn and, and when I say tell us about yourself um, I really want to know how long have you been a comedian and what mm-hmm. made you um, even want to get into comedy um, I've been a comedian about four and a half years, full time about two and a half years. Um, pe- everybody kept telling me I was a funny dude. They was like a funny dude, and I thought they were just saying that to dismiss what I was saying. Um, because I just make comments about, "Oh, you're funny." So I tried one of them Instagram videos, <laughs> and it had got like eighty thousand views, wow. and I was like, "Oh, wow. wow, maybe I am a funny dude." So <laughs> <laughs> I, then I tried stand up, and um, I bombed bad. But the thing is about stand up is that um, once you do it for the first time, once you get over that fear, mm-hmm. you can't stop doing it after that. Do you think you- most people bomb? I was going to say. Yeah. yeah. This is the thing about yeah, I, I want to tell because there's like this myth out. And you always hear famous comedians say that um, they, they got on stage and they were just hilarious. Um, no one gets on stage and it's just hilarious. This is a craft. You have to work on it. You got to get do open mics every night. Like it's an actual process to being funny and it takes years to be funny. Because oh, I was going to ask where you, did you bomb because you weren't ready or did you bomb because of the crowd? Because um, mm-hmm. I know that they said that there's a thing about timing and of course, feeling out the mm-hmm. audience and, and there's a rhythm or or there's a vibe to it. So do you think you were just unprepared or was it just the wrong type of people that you were performing in front of? Uh, no, it's just the process. When you first write a joke, the, the joke immediately, um, nine times out of 10, isn't going to be funny right away. So this is my first time ever telling these jokes. Like it takes about 
seven to 10 times of telling a joke for you to make it actually find the structure to it and I'll figure out that time and rhythm to it. So it's just the first time I told these jokes, I just needed about nine more times and I would be funny. Mm. Dang, nine. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Have y'all ever been to an open mic before? I have. Yeah. Okay, so you, y'all have seen the unfunny yeah. people? Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? I don't think that, I'm going to say for me, I never thought about why the people were not funny. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Well, I knew they weren't funny, but why was it that they weren't funny? I never thought about um, this just being their first time or their second time where they didn't find their timing um, mm-hmm. or they haven't performed or practiced long enough. I was just like, these motherfuckers ain't funny. Like, where is the funny people? Right. People right like, <laughs> so that's different than using the open mics are during the week. And then uh, what happens is like when you go to a professional show on the weekend is when you'll see the polished material. So like Monday through Thursday, I'm doing about 10 sets of these new jokes and they're not going to be funny. But when you see me on Saturday, I'm going to be hilarious. So that's why them during the week shows be free. Yeah. Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> we work in it. We work in that material. Gotcha. All right. So the again, the name of your comedy special is titled Quarantine Comedy Special. Why? Yes. Why did you title it quarantine now we know that we're in a quarantine mm-hmm. but what at this mm-hmm. time why now did you come up with a comedy special i wanted to me me being um you know sober and everything i wanted to give people a uh, outlet or something to release without going to drugs and alcohol um take their minds off of things so it's just something that they can watch uh without you know a positive way to cope um because i know with me whenever i'm going through stuff i like to just watch comedy and that usually helps me get through things Yes. And I know that the name of or the the premise of your special is about coping. So mm-hmm. you brought up that you were sober. You're going to share with us? You're just going to drop that out there? Or you gonna share? <laughs> I was waiting for him to say something. Wait, like, what? Sh- Shanika, I saw the twinge in your face. So like, <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, I've been sober um, since February for about um, a little over six months now. Mm. Um, I'll make sure I'm doing the math. March, April, May, June, July. About five months, my bad. Um, but you know, with doing comedy, it's a it's a it's a rock. It's weird, you know. Comedy is a nightlife, you know, and everything. And when I first went on tour last year, starting in January, I picked up a drink and have it, started smoking weed, and um, all I know, it was um, November. I'm sitting down. I was thinking to myself, I was like, "How long have I been drinking?" I was like, "I've been drinking like this for about seven months now." I was like, "I think I got a problem," and then. I was like, all right, I'm going to stop drinking. And it was January. I tried to stop drinking. I, like, I literally was like, I'm not drinking. And as I like, was said I wasn't going to do it, I felt a pull. I was like, whoa, I feel like I need to drink. And um, so it, it was something that I really had to like, um, I knew at that point it was like, it was serious. I, I had something going on. My dad was alcoholic and I was like, I don't want to go down that route. So it was like, all right, I need to go sober. So I stopped drinking. I was like, I'm just going to smoke. And um, <laughs> it's natural. Was, it's from the yeah, earth. Yeah, I was like, weed is legal and everything. <laughs> um, but come to find out, like um, that that wasn't good as well. That I was still using that to not really deal with my problems. Um, what ended up happening was that that really made me stop doing things. Is I had a mental breakdown. Um, things, you know, a lot of stress and everything was going on and. I was about to go home with my parents and um, my mom, I had a gig that weekend. My mom was like, you know, don't, you know, do the gig first. You need to, you know, stick out with your obligations. So I do the gig and that weekend um, I was working, I I tore a lot with Jamie Kennedy and um, it was like, he knew I had a mental breakdown. He was that weekend. It was like, he was mentoring me and coaching me. And I didn't tell him I had a mental breakdown. He was just like, yo, if you ever feel the urge to drink, uh, just do more comedy. He was like, that means you're bored. You just need to do more. And like, he was telling me like the ins and outs of how to do things. He was like, I need, I had to move back to New York. He was like, um, you know, get merch to make more money. It's like, he, he taught me the whole game. Cause it, Jamie is like a professional, you know, he's been in big time movies, mm-hmm. torn over 20 years. And like, he mentored me that weekend. And after that, you know, he told me, stop smoking weed. I stopped smoking weed. I stopped drinking. And, um, I just been on the positive after that. Mm-hmm. J.B. Kennedy, one of my favorite movies, Shameless, um, Battle Who's mm-hmm. Both want, Wanted. Hilarious. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> so that's awesome to hear that um, you have been working with him. 
So we're going to talk and we're going to dive into coping. You know, you touched on um, how you've been coping and how you've had Mm -hmm. to deal with the transition of becoming a full time comedian and the stresses that could and have played into Mm -hmm. that. Um, So now that you are sober, you're not drinking, Mm -hmm. you're not smoking. Would you say that you're still as funny as you were before? Absolutely. Um, I think I'm funnier because now I actually have to deal with those emotions and it's an extra level. Like I can tell you actually how I feel and um, which is crazy because I'm still trying to figure out if it's because of my age or is it because of the sobriety. But like um, I feel like before this, I really didn't know what emotions were. Like if you think about like in school, they never really teach men. We never really are taught what emotions are like you. In gym class, they teach you about the vagina, but they don't tell you about the emotions <laughs> that come with dealing with the vagina. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> so <laughs> that's the process that I'm going through right now. So I, I feel like I'm a lot funnier and it's going to relate to a lot more people um, with my comedy. Got you. Are you currently touring? Um, <laughs> it's a trick question. Um, I went on tour three weeks ago. I, I'm not supposed to tour, but I am going to go back on tour probably in about a month. Um, even though that um, is people are dying out here, it's, it's, it's a scary thing. But I, I am. Mm-hmm. It appears that especially with comedians, um, mm-hmm. their job is to be on stage, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you see D.L. Hughley? I did. Yeah, mm-hmm. that that changed a lot for people. That that happened. The, the weekend that happened was the weekend I was on tour, and I just been kind of like, hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so I know the entertainment industry has come up with this when they get back into production, they're going to do it this way. Has there been something um, I'm going to say developed for comedians? Because it seems like co- the comedian um, platform, I don't know if it's changed. It, it, it okay. appears to be if you want to be a comedian, you get out there, you work, you hustle, you perform, 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 perform. You try mm-hmm. to make money, um, you know, to be successful. So mm-hmm. what is there anything that they put together for comedians or how should it be going back to work in this environment? Are there any changes that have been made like to, for COVID? Are there any mm-hmm. precautionary measures that are being made or are they just telling um, comedians not to perform? It's, it's, it's wishy-washy. It's a lot of people. So one thing I'm seeing a lot, you send us in New York right now. New York is always ahead of the game. They're doing outside shows. Um, so I, I'm seeing a lot of that. Some clubs are opening up, not all of them. A lot of them are doing the whole social distance thing uh, with the clubs. Um, but a lot of comedians are like, are like, no, nah, I'm, I'm going to wait to go back on tour um, probably later in the year. Just to, Nobody wants to be the first one to kind of that first wave, kind of like when the vaccine come out. Ain't nobody taking that vaccine at first. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're saying some clubs are doing social distance, but in the South, um, the South is crazy. The South is <laughs> okay, <laughs> and I mean, let's be real. Like, come on, like when this whole COVID thing had happened, right? The Texas, Florida, all, all those states were just yeah, they were just like we going to stay open, but and then it was like laughing at New York, and New York had the high numbers. But if you look at it now, all those states are are <laughs> have the high numbers in New York. You got to have freedom play papers to get in New York. Like, that's how crazy that has is turned. So, um, in comedy, I would say that most people are focusing on digital podcasting, um, sketches, and that sort to just build a fan base and then kind of wait to things, you know, fizz mm-hmm. out. So, let's get into stress. As adults, <laughs> there's a lot of stress that we're hit with, whether that be family stress, work stress, I'm um, mm-hmm. dealing with COVID. Um, we were in a election year. So there's a lot of stress that we have going on. And again, I know that your comedy special is about coping. I hear that you um, turn to alcohol and, you know, marijuana in order to deal mm-hmm. with stress and probably to use it as a coping mechanism. Right. Um, you said you had a mentor and it seems like that's a wonderful idea and it's not anything new even even if it's not a mentor surrounding yourself with people who can talk you either through a process or put you in a better place just by conversation so you did mention how important that was for um jamie kennedy to to be the voice for you 
But mm-hmm. have you found that there have been a lot of people understanding what has gone on with you and, you know, have um, been a, a voice, I guess, for you to talk through things with and, and help you cope with some stresses? I mean, I try to go to therapy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, the problem with my therapist is that he stutters. And um, <laughs> I, I mean, it's, look, I'm serious. Nothing. He really does. <laughs> yeah, Are you being like, funny? No, I'm dead serious. And like, I don't have nothing against people that stutter, but it's a problem when you charge me by the hour. Like, oh it's my, this you know what? I can't. I can't. <laughs> the whole hour just give me up. I'm like, charge me by the word, dude. Like, come on. Mm-hmm. But like, um, I talk to. That's that's the hard part about being an entertainer, man. Like, people don't talk about this. I think Whitney Houston hit on this song. It's a very lonely road when when you go this route and you do have to find people that you can confide and talk to. It's hard to date. Um, A lot of times I I try to find companionships with people. Uh, I'm really close with my mom. um, But a lot of people don't want to talk to you unless you're at a certain level. Like, unless you're at that D.L. Hughley or you that D-Ray Davis. They're like, oh, I don't want to be a part of, you know, your wave that's trying to grow. So um, I, I have like a group of people that I talk to that's sober and um, I, I talk to them and I'm very few. And I just kind of provided them and had that companionship. Mm-hmm. I think we me and Shanika, we talked about this off air, you know, your circle, right? Yeah. So having those circle of people um, and sometimes your circle of people, once you identify that they're not in line or in tune with what you need at that point in time, it's Mm -hmm. okay to kick some of those people out of your circle and to include Mm -hmm. newer people in your circle because... Is uh, that hard though for you? Not for me. Passion don't give a fuck. (laughs) (laughs) You cut them off quick? I do. It, It doesn't... People... We're of an age and I know that you're... I don't know how old you are. How old are you? 28. Oh, shit. Okay, so we're kind of out of here. <laughs> well, he didn't say he was a millennial. He did say. Well, I was thinking uh-huh. like 30 something. But I'll say for my age um, group, people are who they are, right? You watch people mm-hmm. long enough. Better yet, if you're quiet and you listen to people long enough, mm-hmm. they're going to tell you exactly who they are. I don't right. need for you to tell me that you're going to do something because I've listened to you say it. You may not have said it that you're going to do it to me, but I know you have this in you. I'm not going to wait for you to do it for, to me. No, I, I'm good. And yeah. life is just, I've taken the perspective that life is kind of too short. I don't have no time to fuck around with people who, they're not doing what, I, what I'm doing for mm-hmm. myself if they're not doing it for their, themselves, if they're not trying to excel, if they're not trying to better themselves, if they're not trying to be a better person. And I think there's a difference between mm-hmm. bettering themselves and being a better person. Um, mm-hmm. When you try to be a better person, that's about self-reflection. That's about understanding right. certain things that you're doing are right, wrong, and indifferent and trying to change them. You got some people who's well in their 40s kind of sitting back and doing the same thing over and over again, getting the same result over and over again, mm-hmm. but not willing to change anything that they're doing. I have no time for that. None. So did that come with, have you always been like that? Like, no. You know, okay. I've not always been like that. So it was growth. Like over time you develop the patience. Yep. Then, okay. Yep. Because I'm going through that right now. I will say that I think for the most part, I've always been a no nonsense type of person. But understanding uh-huh. when to let somebody go about their business has been something that I have learned over the years and getting uh-huh. older and adulting and understanding uh-huh. that that is one thing that I am glad that I'm at the place in my life in which you can be here if you don't want to be here. And I'm not even talking about from a romantic perspective, I'm talking about mm-hmm. from a friend perspective, because right. it's easy for me to cut you off. It's like if mm-hmm. you're not. If you're not bringing anything to the table and the one thing that you need to be bringing, not bringing to the table is drama and Mm -hmm. extra energy Mm -hmm. and just killing a vibe. So if you're doing that, I can cut you off because you're not good for me. You're not you're not Mm -hmm. good for this situation. Mm -hmm. So let's just go about our business. That has that has come on with growth. And I'm going to tell you, the balance of that is Mm -hmm. meeting people where they are. So I'm easy to cut someone off. But what I'm learning is to understand why the person is the way that they are. Mm, okay. And that is where I am in the point 
in my life in which, yes, it's easy for me to cut you off and that may be good, but there could be a reason of why you act the way that you act, you respond the way that you act. And that's where I am in my life and processing that. And that's hard. Mm-hmm. Like you got to take a step back. You, you literally, instead of wanting to react, you have to take a step back and say, because I do this all the time, especially at work. I think I work with some of the dumbest ass people on the planet. <laughs> so it can just be an email. I'll send the email out saying, okay, today we're going to do blah, blah, blah. There's going to be one person who's going to be like, well, did you say we were going to do blah, blah, blah? And right. initially, my first response, I'd be ready to hit the reply and be like, bitch, didn't I just say that? Right? <laughs> mm-hmm. But people hear things and interpret things and their level of education is different and their level of um, the emotional intelligence, the, um, their emotional intelligence is different. So mm-hmm. sometimes people just need that reassurance of I heard what you said, but is this right. exactly like just to clarify? I get that sometimes. I also get that maybe just because I typed out five words. And it made sense to me. That doesn't mean it's going to make sense to Vaughn. And that doesn't mean it's going to make sense to Shanika. So sometimes there is some reiteration of, yes, this is what I said. And not being emotional about it because I am an emotional person where you heard the first word I said I was going to type. Bitch. (laughs) Every time I want to respond to somebody that I think said something stupid, my first word is, bitch. But I have have to back away from that because Mm -hmm. that's my emotional response to that. And if I could take a step back, not say anything, process, and then just Mm. respond, that has has, um, proven to be success, at least for me. What about you, Mm -hmm. Shanika? And I think also understanding that some people is not innocent. Some people are trying to draw you in. Some people are trying to bait you for a response and you have to recognize that your energy is worth more than that. You know, you're not going to be their entertainment Mm -hmm. and you really have to step back and say, you know what? I'm not, I'm not even going to give it to you like that. You know, I know we've coined the term nice, nasty. (laughs) (laughs) Look, I can hit this reply button and be cussing you out. It all depends (laughs) on your filter. But you won't be able to prove anything. (laughs) And on a personal note, um, misery loves company. Mm -hmm. You you have those people around you in your circle that are just miserable. Like you have people who sit back and they're envious of what you're doing. They're envious Mm -hmm. of your success. And Mm -hmm. they'll stick around long enough just to see how you move, operate, and even wait for your downfall. And you have to realize that some people that are in your circle, they're not worth the time, energy, and or emotion. And you have to deal with those people accordingly. Yeah, that's 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 exactly what I'm going through now because um people can see your trajectory. And I, I one thing I'm realizing is that a lot of people um I feel like a lot of people want to be famous or be around somebody that's going to be famous. And it's like, it's kind of scary um, in a way. It's like, you kind of got to see what people objectives and what their motives are. And and you kind of, kind of keep your distance. And they start to realize through listen, as you were saying, like, you know, do they really care about you Mm -hmm. or do they care about what they're getting out of the situation? Mm -hmm. A lot of people want validation. So if that's validation through your success, validation through, you know, things that you have, just who you are as a person. They just want that validation. So that discernment is important as well. You know, mm-hmm. I think a lot of people, everybody just kind of go with the flow, it seems, instead of truly, truly taking a, uh, taking a step back and looking at who, who you're around and why these people are around you. So, yeah, to right. this point. You have to be, you have to exercise discernment coming into a relationship, whether it's friendship, romantic, whatever. But don't, hmm, don't hesitate to shut it down. Yeah. <laughs> shut it <laughs> down. <laughs> like it's tiring. It Vaughn is, is so tiring. Mm-hmm. Um, like you said, when people bring in drama constantly, we're at an age where, you know, look, I don't have time for it. You are sucking the life out of me. Mm-hmm. And if it, at the end of the day, if it's you or me, Oh, it's mm-hmm. going to be you. It's going to be you. <laughs> it's going to be you. And we know that. This, Go ahead. And I was going to say, one thing that gets, gets me, I don't know if y'all deal with this. I, I have a problem with guilt. 
Like I feel guilty over the little. Like if somebody's ever done done anything, for yeah. me, I feel bad. Like I'm like, yo, I don't want to leave. I'm like, they did this for me. Like I can't just cut them off. Like and that's one of the hardest things. It's just not. I don't. I never want to feel bad about just leaving people behind. Like it's. it's I don't know. Y'all never. Y'all don't have that at all. When I was younger, I, I'll say it's it's in your thought process. So you okay. don't want to feel guilty about leaving someone behind. Flip it in your mind to say, well, what you did to the what you did for the person. So it's not that you're leaving them behind. You did this, 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 and it didn't work out. Like it's okay. Mm. It's okay for you to have the best intentions for people to enter a relationship. Let's say a, a platonic relationship and want to be cool ass friends and it mm-hmm. didn't work out. It's okay. You can walk away and not feel guilty. If you were truthful in your interaction and in your role in that relationship or in that situation, it shouldn't be. Well, I don't want to walk away because I'm going to feel guilty. Shit, you should be walking away saying that they're going to miss out on blah, 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 because you entered it in a, in the purest form. Mm, I see what you're saying. Shanika said it, it, at the end of the day, if it's you or me, like th- there are people out there who truly don't want the best for you. There's some people right. who don't want you to win no matter mm. what it is. Now, I'm not telling you to treat everybody like that. I'm just telling you to be honest and open about how life is. So, you know, there's some people that's going to root for you and ride for you. There's some people who's there for opportunity and there's just some people who don't give a shit about you. And once you have identified these people or their their traits, their character, who they are, then deal with them accordingly. And that doesn't necessarily mean somebody do something, cut them off. That just means when somebody shows you who they are, freaking believe them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if you know who you are as a person and the value that you bring and 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 that you're entering things and for the right reasons, it should never mm-hmm. be about you feeling guilty cuz you had mm-hmm. to leave a motherfucker on the side of the road of your life. Hold on. Of your life, you're feeling guilty because you had to somebody going to be pissed off because you didn't do blase blah or you decided to not be bothered with them. Of your life? Mm-hmm. Nah. Mm-mm. And even understanding that some people will manipulate relationships, you know, mm-hmm. they will try to make you feel bad about situations. I've had situations where, you know, I think I think I do okay. You know, I'm not balling out of control, but I'm okay. And I've even had people, must be nice to have that. Must be nice to do this. Oh, yeah. You doggone right it is. I work hard for everything. (laughs) I work hard for everything I have. But again, people trying to guilt you into a situation. Mm -hmm. Ah, peace. I have to start, you know, distancing myself from you in that respect. Because at the end of the day, that's about them. That's an issue they have. That's not a me issue. That's a them issue. They have to deal with that. And and I and I'm not gonna sit up here and uh entertain it. Mm-hmm. I feel that. Yvonne, you talked about your therapist. Mm-hmm. So black I- man seeing a therapist <laughs> <laughs> one time. Yeah. So so I have um a, a part of your comedy specials that I would like to play in okay. which you talk about starting therapy. All right. Mm-hmm. So we're gonna listen to it. Start going to therapists, a therapy for my bad attitude. Do your research before you go because my therapist gave me terrible advice. He said, whenever somebody makes you mad, you count down from 10 to 1. That shit ain't work. I went back to him. He was like, explain to me why it didn't work. And I told him, I was sitting down. A dude walked past me, bumped me on my shoulder, knocked me over. He didn't apologize. I was mad. So I stood up. I started counting out loud. 10, 9, 8, 7. And he was like, this didn't work. I'm like, I thought it was because people was running away from me. <laughs> Hiding behind seats. Then I got tased and put in a holding cell. He was like, that's your problem. You're not supposed to say it out loud. Especially not on the plane. Uh, <laughs> not on the plane. <laughs> not on the plane. Not on the play. So your, your therapist, how long have you been going to therapy? And let me also ask you this. Not h- also how long. What, if anything, has therapy taught you? And mm-hmm. Shanika gave you a, a applaud. We say it all the time. Black mm-hmm. people need therapy, especially black men, in order to deal with 
trauma and past life experiences. So if you had the opportunity to speak to um, black Mm -hmm. men, what would you tell them about therapy, your experience and why you decided to do it? Um, I went to therapy. I went on and off um, at first, Um, but I've been consistently going, I'll say probably about six months now. Um, One thing I think therapy should be free for black people in general. Um, because it's like Part of reparation. the reparation package. Yeah. <laughs> and even if they don't give us money, I think we should get some free type of mental health because of the trauma from slavery. Because I don't think we ever learned how to grieve. We have not. Um, and, you know, because right after sla- slavery, it was just like, you know, you didn't have time to cry. You gotta go find an apartment. Like, that's how quick, like, things have happened. Shanika liked so, what you said. Look at her face. When she gets the focus faced, <laughs> she's, she's ready to go. Shut up. Am, am I lying, I'm Shanika? Listening. I mean, I love it. Keep, keep <laughs> so, um, but for black men in general, I, I think that um, this word toxic masculinity that everybody throws around, I hate it because it sounds like the name of a gym. And, um, but <laughs> <laughs> it's a real thing. It is. And I didn't understand what it was, but a lot of it is, it is because our parents know we're taught how to parent. You know, their parents were never taught how to parent. So we learned a lot of things as black people that necessarily wasn't healthy for us. Like one thing, you know, that I know that, that I have an issue with is I, with dating. You know, my, my parents told me, you know, my dad told me that um, don't don't date because um, it's a distraction. My dad, a married man, was telling me don't date because it's a distraction. Women are a distraction. You don't need to be dating. So my whole life, I'm thinking I got to, I can't, you know, be in a relationship because it's going to mess up my money. Like it's going to, ruin my life and like little things like that that were taught affect us you know in the long run um but therapy really helps you sit down you know reflect on things that your parents told you and, and kind of overcome those fears step by step it's a process it's not something that's gonna happen overnight it might take 10 years it might take 20 years to to, to deal with it would you would you tell other people black people specifically black men that they need to mm-hmm. invest in therapy I think everybody should invest in therapy. And it is not, it's not a weak thing too. A lot of people are like, oh, you go to therapy, they're going to play with my head. We need that. Everything that they gentrification brings and they bring for white people, we need that in the black neighborhood. We need yoga. We need whole foods. Like we need all those things for it. Like these are like, look at what they give white people. They give white people things that like help them excel in life. You're right. Mental health. <laughs> like that is a priority. And they don't want to tell you, like, I live in Southeast D.C., right? We, we don't have, it's a food desert. We don't have a grocery store within walking distance. But we have six liquor stores. We got um, gas stations and a, a subway um, with a bulletproof glass. So you got people jacked mm-hmm. up on Jolly Ranchers <laughs> and goddamn Hennessy. And they talking about the, the murder rates are high. Like, like oh, you should expect yeah. that. Like, we don't have real food. So, and these are things that, are normal to us. Mm-hmm. Like, can, can you imagine you being born in this and this is all you've seen, you know nothing better? Um, mm-hmm. So I encourage every Black dude to go to therapy, try it out, and don't be afraid and ashamed. Huh? Your circle might not go to therapy. You talk about that. Your other Black friends might not go, but, you know, be different. Mm. Oh, yeah. And I think, um, in addition to what you said, one of the reasons we do it, I think, is because we've been in survival mode so long that we don't know. Um, a lot of people don't even know about the Whole Foods. People don't mm-hmm. know about that because since we got here, we've been in survival mode. Mm-hmm. You know, we we just trying to scratch and survive. And that's the <laughs> <Yeah>. time. <laughs> we've been scratching and surviving. So at the end of the day, and coping, so mm. self medicating with the alcohol and the drugs and, and the food and the food. And I'm going to say this: oh, just to throw it out there. <laughs> I don't even know if I should say it, but with the church, you know, <laughs> I think I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I, I think in some instances we use that as a a coping mechanism yes. and also as an excuse not to move because mm-hmm. even though people will quote, you know, Oh, faith without works is dead. Most people don't act. They just, well, we just pray. hope and pray, hope no, and pray, pray hope it. and pray. Like, pray on it. 
we are good for hoping and praying, you know? And it's like, we need some action behind that, hoping and praying yeah, as well. Still need action. And this is something I haven't really talked about publicly, but there is an issue with hip hop. Mm. Uh, and I don't want to say it in a way where it's like I'm trying to attack hip hop because it's black culture. But if you listen to our music, like mm. <laughs> Future, like Future, like all he talks about is drugs. Like you're hearing that on the radio, Molly Percocet all day. Like that's mm-hmm. putting that in people's heads. So it's like our our music is contaminated. It's a it's a problem that white people on black culture and there's a certain type of music that's on the radio because there is better music out there but it's not played on the radio Mm -hmm. so at what point do we actually go out and seek those things that um, are better for us Um, because you can turn the radio station Mm -hmm. you can pop in your your, I was about to say CDs I'm aging myself turn your bluetooth (laughs) Jesus Christ asleep but you have that I know I'm guilty I still have CDs but that that's something that we can we can control. And like I'm going through this awakening stage and self-accountability stage myself. Um, as far as okay, we know what's wrong, right? Mm-hmm. In some cases. Do in some cases, that's why I said in some cases, right? Okay. Um, we're at de- different stages of, of awakening. Mm-hmm. Um, but at some point we have to, as we get to that realization, we have to start doing things different. Mm -hmm. So, um, and and so Pasha, Pasha and I both born and raised in Miami, right? I was born off two like crew and all of this booty shaking music and stuff. Mm -hmm. At this age, I know not to play that in front of a child, a a three, four, five, six year old. So I monitor you know, my interactions because it's like, okay, I know that's not, that that's not necessarily the healthiest or the best thing to do. So certain things I have to change. And I think as we get to that stage of awareness, we're going to have to model the behavior for others. Mm -hmm. So turn that radio station or even have the conversation with some other people. Okay. Yeah. I know you're listening to that, but how about this offer Mm -hmm. an alternative? Um, I think so. You're saying what we as the consumers got to do, but I think also as entertain, like I, as me, like becoming sober now, I'm also found that my purpose is to put out content now, like my next albums and just things in general, to be positive. Don't put out mm-hmm. certain things. Like one thing, I'm I'm stopped using the N word. I'm not gonna drop the N word no more in any albums that I do and content that I produce and putting that out there. I'm not going to be, you know, talking about smoking weed or getting high anymore. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think even though he, he did some terrible things, Bill Cosby. <laughs> <laughs> he has, Cliff Huxtable. Cliff Huxtable was a great guy. Bill Cosby was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but he had he had a lot of great points, even though he, he was a bad person. But I, I think that as entertainers, we we have to we have to shift the culture. Just like I don't know if you noticed that there was some um, athletes who are going to HBCUs now. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Like that's that's going to shift because we should have been doing that. Put the power in HBCUs. I think as entertainers, we we need more black entertainers who make it positive and not talk about popping pills and doing drugs and alcohol on hip hop platforms. Mm-hmm. And once we get that change and you you start seeing that, I I think that will shift a lot because yeah you you might be around to you know not play that around kids, but there's some parents you know, who who work all the time, who kids are at home just watching TV so they don't mm-hmm. know that their kids are watching this type of stuff. So I, I think some of the change has to come with the entertainers and um, these platforms. And just to kind of piggyback off, because Shanika, you posed a question. Um, I think, and we talked about paying it forward and not being silent, right? So mm-hmm. where certain things may be normal to us growing up, or being a part of our culture, when the person has identified that it's no longer cool to do X, Y, and Z, I mm-hmm. think it, it should be the responsibility of that person to engage and inform others as well. And even right. if you reach back and you change the mind of one person, right? Mm-hmm. You, can't, you can't get everybody. But I don't think you should sit in an environment where you know people are doing X, Y, and Z, and you, you know better and you're not saying anything. And I think mm-hmm. it, 
comes with being comfortable too long. Um, at some point in time, you have to be uncomfortable. You have to be the person mm-hmm. to say, that ain't right. Um, and when it's not right for you and you try to to talk it out and and reach back to bring someone up and say all that. And if it's not working, then you need to get out of that situation. And I kind of think that's at least Shanika. I know that we've done that in certain situations where if you have people that are doing X, Y, and Z, and this is not your party or you don't want to do that anymore, it's okay. I'm going to remove myself from this situation. No, I'm probably going to tell you about it first. And then I'm going to go ahead and remove myself from the situation because um, I think we get complacent around each other and we may know that someone's doing something wrong, but we'll say t- amongst in a small group, oh, you know, they shouldn't be doing blah, 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 such as right. playing the kid music around the kids, but never saying to that person, you shouldn't be playing this music for this apparent reason because there's probably going to be a fallout. But here right. it is, if that person is playing that type of music around their children, who knows what else they're exposing that child to. And to be honest with you, is this somebody that you truly want to be around? So right. you got to look at it that way. But I think once you get to the point where you're comfortable and you're not challenging the status quo, that's when you become the problem. Right. Mm-hmm. So, and I think a lot of that also goes to just knowing yourself. I don't think going back to scratching and surviving, right? I don't mm-hmm. think a lot of us get an opportunity to truly get to know ourselves and 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 um, just develop a, a set of standards for yourself. Um, and with that, you know, you have people who want to fit in with the in crowd or because they have that lack of self-identity, um, their identity is reflected in their clothes or, you know, who they hang with, their cars and stuff, materialistic stuff, instead of building um what is that? Self-realization coming to a point where, you know, mm-hmm. it's okay. It's okay if I don't have, you know, name brand from head to toe. It's okay if um, I don't have the latest car or what have you. It's okay if I don't drink. It's okay if I don't smoke, you know? And right. I think a lot of people get, um, they're, they're just heavily influenced by what other people think because they're just not, you know, they haven't established standards for themselves mm-hmm. and that, that's uh, that's true and I, I, that's what I, say. I think entertainment has a majority to do with that because everybody's influenced by entertainment and um, it's crazy because um, a, a guy I went to um, elementary school with this dude was a good guy on a roll and everything and um, I know his parents met them like we would spend a night over each other good guy and um, he's a rapper now and he's rapping about <laughs> drinking lean and Molly. And I'm looking at the video and I'm like, dude, like, I know you. Like, <laughs> like we watched Barney together. And he was talking about drinking lean. Like, it just, it blew my mind. It's like, he's putting that content out there. And now that's cool. Like, that's cool. Like, I, I, I think that is the biggest issue, especially with kids. Because kids are, are very influenced. You talk about know yourself. Kids don't really, you don't really get to know yourself until you really become an adult. So it's like, they're just going based off what they see. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I don't think we challenge children enough. Um, I think we underestimate children. Mm-hmm. Um, and even having discussions with them to just kind of get their feedback about what's going on with them and around the world. When you're talking about coping, as adults, we're dealing with the quarantine, COVID, you know, being stuck in the house, all of this stuff. How are the children coping as well? We're not having yeah. those, those conversations with them. I'm glad. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up. So I personally don't have any school age children. Thank you. <laughs> My daughter graduated this year. Congratulations. <laughs> From high Congratulations. school. Thank you. But but I look at some of my friends who have children. Realistically, I'm going to say elementary school because that's mm. that's that age in which children probably need the most type the the most help from you in a certain kind of way. Like they need you to be there every step of the way for them to do certain things. So Mm -hmm. I have a friend, her daughter loves certain subjects, hates certain subjects. So she, of course she hates the math, science, all that stuff, but loves the reading and and those other creative subjects. So now that COVID hit and everybody's um, learning from a virtual perspective, they're getting frustrated 
as parents because they're trying to still live. So the transition from working from out um, outside of the home to fully being in the home, everybody's in the house, right? Mm-hmm. So this other um, thing that you now have to do is help your child learn. That was normally mm-hmm. done in school. So that added stress of trying to be online, answer emails, handle the, the child with the schoolwork and all that stuff. And the child is now getting frustrated. The child is, for lack of better words, having, I'm going to say emotional fits or it's affecting them emotionally mm-hmm. because mommy or daddy doesn't know how to handle me in this situation because they're trying to cope. And here it is. I'm going through the same thing because COVID has affected them as well. Their whole right. learning environment, their whole Monday through Friday has changed. You're expecting, Not being able to see their friends. Not being able to see their mm-hmm. friends. Some children due to COVID, that was the only meal that they would get to eat for the day, right? Mm-hmm. Or the ability to be able around, to be able around to, excuse me, the ability to be able to be around people who listen to them who cared about them. So now they're in these homes 24 hours a day with sometimes abusive and unfit parents Mm -hmm. expecting to uh, maintain this status of, I'm going to say this, we came up with this online learning curriculum. So now you have to work on that or try to um, at least pass these classes. But here it is, you have this small child who their whole life has been disrupted. Everybody can't learn virtually. So you have that as well. And then mommy is coping and and maybe not handling things always in the best manner or daddy, whoever is at home trying to help these kids and not knowing that the kid is going through something as well. I don't think we ever looked at COVID through the lens of what the children are going through. And um, this could cause more acting out. This could cause more. Mm. um, You start to see depression, depression, anxiety, Mm -hmm. all type of stuff. And I don't think that we're equipped to deal with that because like Shanika said, we're scratching and surviving every day. So half of these parents parents have to, or their usual was to go out in the world, work Mm -hmm. nine to five, um, make, they knew that they had to take care of their kids after five o'clock because between that time when they were at school, they were being taken care of. So now they're having to do it all. Some of them without the resources, some of them being told, let's say if they were um, sent home because of quarantine, some of these people are being put in a position where they're being told that they have to come back to work. So if you have to come back to work and yes, it's summertime, but when school starts up, if the child is still in a virtual learning um, setting, how do you balance that? How do you balance that if you have to go back to work and you have a six-year-old who's not going back to school? Mm. Yeah, that's real. It's a lot that's of coping. Uh, COVID, yeah. is, COVID has put us in a posture that we have not had to deal with. And I think the repercussions of COVID has just been seen because I think a lot of comp- companies are being flexible with how um, employees are working and standards that they're allowing at this point in time. In a couple months, we're going to see some things that are probably going to be detrimental to people. And if they... Mean? People are going to lose their jobs. People are going to lose their homes. People are going to have to to make that decision on whether they're going to go to work and may not have adequate child care. And what are they going to do with their children? People are going to have to go back to work, make the decision to go back to work and potentially expose themselves to COVID-19 and bring that back to their family. Right. It's, it's going to get it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better with COVID. Yeah, it's 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 because I, I haven't even thought about it from that that aspect. I I, I don't have kids yet, and um, that's 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 a lot of pressure. I've been noticing Trump is really trying to push for these schools to be open. Um, mm-hmm. Wow, that's, yeah. that's that's. I think the state of Florida has ooh. said that they wanted kids to be back in school mm-hmm. the beginning of the new school year. Um, as you know, Florida is a hot spot. So please tell me how you're going to bring back. And the data is now showing before it was like, well, children, young children and teenagers and stuff, they would be susceptible or they're not getting COVID. Not everybody's getting goddamn COVID. You can't tell, uh, you can't say what demographics or what part of the population can't get COVID-19. You can't say that anymore. So now you're telling kids 
or you're telling parents that they have to send their kids back to school full time. And then if mm-hmm. the school, the state or the school boards don't do it, then they're going to lose funding. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's going to be some hard decisions that are going to have to be made. And there's going to be. It's going to be a heavy amount of stress that's going to be put on people that they didn't normally have to deal with before. Right, right. Um, oh, you that added stress in my life. This thinking about that, oh. I'm like, whoa. I'm mm-hmm. like, this is. I'm going to tell you this. I thought about how grateful that I am that I don't have to deal with that decision, but it saddens me to think yeah. about the people who have to. And I know people who are going to have to make the t- tough decision on if school opens back up fully to send their children back to school or not to risk that. Mm-hmm. Um, and who, if the employment environment changes, that they're going to have to make a decision on whether they're going to keep this job and go back into work or they're going to walk away and be like, I can't risk it. And then employment then p- possibly be an issue for them. I, mm-hmm. I, I'm just glad that I'm not in that situation, but my neighbor, when I'm not talking about literally, I'm just talking about the person next to me. Anybody that I see could be in that that position where they have to make that tough choice of what it is that they're going to do. I'd say um, this whole thing has taught me that um, you got to have some type of savings. You, you got to put money away for times because you never know something like this could happen. You got to have a few stacks put away just in case something like this happens. You got We're scratching and surviving. We're scratching. We are. And, and what I think what it has proven is that we can't expect for our government to bail us out. Um, right. <laughs> or to be that cushion. So I think that reinforces what you said about making sure that you are saving or have some type of asset. You have something that if we are to continue in this posture or if it happens again, whether that be decades down the road, we can use this as a learning lesson on how Mm -hmm. to prepare because the government wants to give people $1,200. Yeah. $1,200 can't even pay for four months. For four months. $1,200 can can barely pay someone's (laughs) rent and or mortgage for a month. So what are you supposed to do for the other three plus months? Yeah. Yeah. And I also want to add that I also think we need to go back to old school and build our communities, build our tribe. Um, The government isn't going to take care of us at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, I think we need to be more intentional about who we are surrounding ourselves with. Um, I know looking at other, and I'll just say again, just coming from Miami, looking at other cultures that come to the States, they tend to be more family oriented. They don't have, yeah, well, all, everybody, say, else. Yeah, everybody else, <laughs> everybody else, everybody else, everybody else out of everybody black, or out of African Americans, black African Americans. Everybody else has some sense of family in which they look out for each other. Yes, and you have generations of families living under one roof, um, and they they help. They use collective economics. We talk about supporting black business and collective economics, but we don't. True. We can do better in that realm, I would say. Um, as far as living together, again, how are we going to get these stacks when we scratching and surviving, Vaughn? Like, seriously. Uh, so, <laughs> like, literally, we've talked about, I've even told Passion and some of my other friends, look, we need to go ahead and all move in together. It don't make any sense. You paying a stack sure? over here, I'm paying a stack over here. Let's go ahead and get us a, a nice little five, six bedroom house, a little compound. Mm-hmm. We can all right. stay together and make this money, stack this dough, you know. But again, everybody does it except us. Um, even as far as, you know, children, you have people who are paying hundreds, if not thousands of dollars for child care. Why? When we can build that sense of community. Um, I know we're a transient nation now, so people are all over the place, but I think it's very important to build, you know, these alliances with people who can help elevate each other. Right. And I think this is a, a, a perfect opportunity to do it. Um, I, so you used to talk about building stacks, stuff like that. As an American culture, we're very materialistic. Um, I, I think that most people live outside their means. Um, if mm-hmm. we, we have to learn how to just have necessities, and I learned that, like, 
in order, if you really want something in life, you'll learn how to just only have your necessities. You don't need the, you know, the flyers car. Go on your car. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to have the biggest TV and stuff like that. Um, but a way for everybody to cope that's going through all this stress is you should watch the Von Michael Quarantine comedy special <laughs> in your living room. <laughs> hey, I, I'm here for it. <laughs> yes. But um, um, this, this identity, and you say other, you know, groups that, that have, like, you know, they come together. A lot of that is on purpose that Black people not like that. Like, slavery, and you talk mm-hmm. about how this quarantine, like, we're going to see the effects moth down from now slavery we're just seeing the effects of it now that that's why we don't we don't stick together that's why you know people want to impress the slave master so bad mm-hmm. like we, and we don't trust one another we need so that. that's that's hindering our ability yeah. to build communities as well we don't trust one another right and, and a lot of that i don't even blame black people no more like i used to like you want people to be like dang black people don't do this like i i give mm-hmm. black people the biggest benefit of doubt um, all the time. Like, um, I bank black now, one United Bank. And they're, you know, one of the first things everybody asks, you know, do they have any locations where we live? It's like, no, but however, if more people join, they'll have more locations. Like, you just mm-hmm. got to give black people the benefit of the doubt. We, we got to, you have to do extra for black people. Um, and um, we can't save stacks. We, we really can't save stacks. It, it's a mentality. We, mm-hmm. It goes back to like, I blame hip hop again. And I sound like one of them old white dudes, but talk about having the flyest car, all the money, the name brand, like not forget all that. Like buy Walmart clothes and save thirty percent of your paycheck. Mm-hmm. It, it it's possible. Like if if you want to do it, like it, it's doable. What you're not saying yeah. is anything that if we wanted to do, we could do. I think we've gotten into this level of being comfortable um, yeah. with things that are truly not important. Mm. And one day I'm going to stop buying sneakers, Vaughn. I'm just mm. going to stop doing it. But. <laughs> it's just, I, this is what I say, like when you get that check, 30%, like don't look, look at your check all the time with 30% taken out. 30% mm-hmm. is savings. Like make that mandatory. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So now I want to talk about, and I know Vaughn, you're a millennial. Me, me and Shaniqua oh. were just a little bit older than that. But <laughs> Since you have gotten just a little bit, just a little bit, but since you've gotten older, um, what's one thing that you actually enjoy now that you're older, or getting mm-hmm. older has actually taught you? One thing that I enjoy: water, drinking water. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you, Vaughn. Look, I'm, I'm bougie though. I drink Fiji water, so I got that level of bougie. <laughs> I was bougie homeless at one point. Like I would. <laughs> I would only sleep in the suburbs. <laughs> they were like, where you live? In a cul-de-sac. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> but uh, things that take care of your bite, like water, like I, I, I love drinking water now because when we were young, I grew up on Kool-Aid and like I would I hate water. I would mm-hmm. just be like, no, I want Kool-Aid, tea, juice. But when you start to understand what it does for your body and the way it makes you feel after you, you know, you drink it, um, I appreciate that so much now. Hmm. Shanika, what have, hmm. what do you enjoy? Or what has getting older taught you? Um, one thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say I, I can truly appreciate doing those things that make me happy. Okay. Um, and I will do it by myself. So that's another thing. I don't wait for anybody. I I, I may make a general statement about what I'm going to do or what's going to happen. If you're coming, come on. If not, peace. Like, yeah, I don't wait on anybody um, in order for me to enjoy life. And I'm going to tell you one thing that I um, enjoy now and have actually, I think, learned how to enjoy as I have gotten older is having peace. Mm-hmm. Like, I truly know what peace looks like. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why I'm so quick to cut people off that if you are going to interrupt or impede on my peace, I can't do it. 
Mm. I go to sleep yeah. every night and sleep well. I'm talking about eight plus hours if I want to. Just slobbing Slob. it. Slobbing. <laughs> <Just. laughs> and, and I'm not going to sit here and say that my life is perfect because it's not. But I'm at peace. Like I don't have any outside factors disrupting my peace. And a part of that is because I have not allowed for any outside factors to disrupt my peace. So mm-hmm. I I understand what peace is. And I don't think a lot of people understand what peace is. They understand what chaos is. They're comfortable in chaos. They're comfortable in drama. That's their yeah. norm. That's their norm. They're familiar with it. And for them to be comfortable with peace makes them uncomfortable for a certain period of time. So as you said, you um, uh, Vaughn, you fit, would feel guilty if something didn't happen and you had to, let's say, take yourself out of a situation or a relationship. Mm-hmm. No, that's you. That's you either striving to or staying in peace. You got, you got to look at what peace is for you. And if taking yourself or removing yourself from a situation is going to allow for you to be in a state of peace, right. that's what you have mm-hmm. to do. Gotcha. So peace, I, I hold on to that and I value my peace very much because we're not promised tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Truly not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ain't that the truth? Ashlyn took us to church. Uh-huh. <laughs> Ask a collection plate. <laughs> no, I'm going to say when it, it was like an epiphany for me to get to a certain level in life where certain things is just not going to bother me. And that's because I understand and I appreciate and I value what my peace looks like. Like, I'm, I'm not mm-hmm. going to be out there trying to um, do what the next person is doing. I'm not going to be out there trying to be in any type of relationships that are toxic or unproductive. I'm not going to put myself in a situation in which I'm truly going to be unhappy. And if you see the shit coming, I don't know why people are still doing it. I, I understand that people take risks. I know that sometimes people get themselves involved in certain things. I'm going to talk about romantic relationships where it may not be the best thing, but hey, you try it. All I'm saying is when shit get bad, realize that you need to let it go and keep it moving. I don't think that peace should make you not try things, explore, find new Mm -hmm. things. No, I'm just saying to identify when When to to cut it off. When to cut it off. Mm -hmm. Because you're peace. That's what you're holding on to. Not that this person is going to be upset with me. Not that we're not going to be friends anymore. Not that my peace is more important. Yeah, I feel that. So now that we we talked about what we enjoy, so what do we not enjoy (laughs) about getting older? Or what... Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, what do we not en- what do we not enjoy about getting the aging process, the adulting process? I I I have nothing. I enjoy it all. I mm. I I'm happy to be honest with you. Um, for me, and I, I feel like that. Um, I'm an old soul, and I feel like that. Uh, especially like I just look at my peers like, that that I'm. Um, Learn the things a lot quicker and stuff like that, and I'm I enjoy getting older and, and my perspective changing. Um, like right now, I'm going through this phase of like, um, and this is one of the downfalls of being millennials and growing up as a millennial is that um, likes and views. I feel a lot of people use that as like validation, and um, mm-hmm. I, I'm getting to the point now. I'm starting to understand like that stuff don't mean nothing. Um, <laughs> I'd rather be at like your family and who you care about and stuff like that is more important. So um, there's, there's nothing that I, I, I hate about getting older. I, I really enjoy it. Oh, so I, overall I do. I, I think each year has been better than the next as far as experiences getting older. But mm-hmm. let me tell you what <laughs> I was just, so you don't know this bar, but you know. <laughs> I'm a little entrepreneur, got a couple things going on. Right before we got on, I told Pasha, I literally just came in the house and I'm I'm going to do a shameless plug. Nile striping. I strike parking lots, me and family business. Okay. Let me tell you, it is hot as all get out outside. We- <laughs> 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 right before we started podcasting, I had literally run in the house, jumped in the shower and, and hopped on here. Let me tell you, I have what I don't enjoy is I have to be more intentional about 
getting these old bones moving. Whereas okay. before, 10 years ago, you can just go do some stuff. <laughs> oh, no. I have to stretch. <laughs> before and after, I was like, Pasha, I'm going to have to go start running, jogging, something, swimming. Because, honey, yeah, yeah, these bones, honey. Yeah. I, I can understand. I had, um, <laughs> I had dated a cougar before and Ah, um, wow. We may need yeah. you for another show. And she would always have her her joints were always hurt. And I was like, yo, I'm mm-hmm. never I'm sick of 25 year olds after this. I was like, never again. Look at here. <laughs> the Epsom salt bath, it's okay. It's okay. We just have to do a little prep work before, but yeah, I was like, okay, <laughs> this, this, this working from home isn't helping it at all. So it's like, whoa, I'm really feeling the difference now versus uh, before COVID when I was, you know, out and about working at home and, and then going to do that. Oh no. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be soaking in the tub tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say for me, um, I feel like I'm racing against time. Mm. And that's scary for me. Not that. Why? You know, being all deep, passionate. No, I take this, I take this podcast serious. Okay. I'm <laughs> no, when I say I feel as though I'm ra- racing against time, I think I started to explore um, certain things, whether it be hobbies, passions in my life later. And I kind of feel like I'm behind the eight ball when it comes to certain things. So the older that I get, I feel like my timeline should have been pushed back just a little bit so that um, maybe I could have had. And this is just all talking. um, I should have experienced different things. I would say certain benchmarks I probably should have reached already. Um, So I feel like I'm racing against time trying to catch up some. Yeah, hold. How old are you? You don't ask a lady. Gosh, how old are you, gosh, <laughs> You don't ask a lady how old they are. What's your Facebook page? Let me check it. On. I will tell you that I'm over forty. Over forty, but okay, all right. Um, and how long have you been podcasting? Oh, Ten years, on and off. Okay, because like I, the vibe from this show, even when I got on, like I already. The, the conversation is more in depth, like, cause I do, I'm doing interviews, you know, and I get other people's platforms. It's already in depth. So it's like, it already feel, I could see y'all like on Sirius XM. Like, I wouldn't be surprised. Bon, like, speak that was, into existence it, again. Speak it. it. Speak <laughs> it. If y'all stay consistent, do the promote and actually put in the work. Like, I really can see you on a huge platform. If not, this right here blows up like the whole age thing. You should watch. I don't know if you watch him already. Gary V. He's very mm-hmm. inspirational yeah. and, mm-hmm. motiv- and motivating. Mm-hmm. Um, you got time, fam. You know what? <laughs> hmm. Thank you. I needed that today. <laughs> but you know, but you know, you know, sometimes you need you need you need that reassurance. I'm glad. I'm glad. And speak that into existence for us because that was one thing that I thought about years ago that I truly, truly, truly wanted to have a platform. On like mm-hmm. Sirius or something like that. And you know what? Years later, you bring it up. It's going to happen. Shanika, pin this. Pin it. Put it on a calendar. Pin it. <laughs> Put it on a vision. <laughs> <laughs> but we have actually, and and, and, I, and before I even close this out, Vaughn, I appreciate what you said in regards to, we always try to make this podcast about us talking, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's all about us. Really, if we were in a room and we, you know, was sitting back and having conversation. This is what the vibe of this podcast is supposed to feel like. So I will say that I think we're doing something right because with you being the first or your first time on the podcast, if you got that experience and as a takeaway, I'm happy behind that. So definitely, I thank, I, had you, lots of fun. I thank you for that. I hope this will not be the last time that we see you. Mm-hmm. No, hit me up anytime y'all want to talk about something. Hit me up. I, I don't care. Like it's not even promo. Just just wanted to, I love to talk. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So um, for those that are listening, in order to get a copy of Vaughn's quarantine comedy special, if you DM him on IG at Vaughn Michael, that's M-Y-C-H-A-E-L, mm-hmm. 
he will give you a link so that you can view the comedy special for free. And Vaughn, because you are out there putting in work, I want for you to tell people how they can stay in contact with everything that you have going on. Yeah, I'm on all social media platforms, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Pornhub. Anything that you want to see me on. <laughs> Let me get my phone. <laughs> Only fans. <laughs> oh, not yet. I don't know yet. Um, but I'm on all social media platforms. Add me. Um, you know, tweet at me. Message me. I, I, I comment back. Um, hop on the wave before, um, you know, I, I'm not able to comment back. So uh, I want to give the material out there for free. I want people to be able to cope. Um, give you a positive way to do that. Uh, if you're going through sobriety, need somebody to talk to, message me about that as well. And um, thank y'all for having me on. Thank you. Thank you. And Shanika, this was another enjoyable, another one, another one for the books. Yes. I should have had yes. my DJ Khaled voice on. <laughs> another one. All right. Thanks for tuning into this episode. And, and until next time, y'all, peace.